Hello, hello and a royal welcome to all my wonderful listeners tuning in from near and far. You're now plugged into the milestone episode 10 of London Ask and Answered. Ah, the charm of London. A city where history meets modernity, where every cobblestone has a story to tell and where the River Thames has witnessed centuries of change. Today we are about to embark on a journey that's as regal as it gets. We're diving deep into the heart of the British capital, right into the illustrious Buckingham Palace. Have you ever felt the allure of its grand gates or wondered about the tales that its walls could narrate? From its inception to its present day glory, from the official tours that offer a sneak peek into the royal lifestyle to the bustling activities that surround this iconic landmark, I've got it all covered for you. But hold on to your headphones, because there's a magical detour ahead. For all the wizard witches and muggles alike, I'm taking a nostalgic trip back to Platform 9 three quarters for the enchanting Back to Hogwarts Day. So dust off your wands and prep your robes, because the Hogwarts Express is about to depart. And because this show is all about you, my cherished listeners, I've sifted through my overflowing mailbox to pick out six burning questions that have kept you up at night. From the quirky to the profound, I'm here to quench your thirst for knowledge. So, whether you are nestled in a cozy corner of your home with a cuppa, taking in the sights and sounds of London on a breezy afternoon, or simply looking for a companion on your daily commute, I'm here to transport you to a world where London's secrets come alive. So, grab your virtual passports, dear listeners, because episode 10 promises a blend of history, magic and a whole lot of fun. Let me set the stage, turn up the volume and dive right in. Welcome to London Ask and Answered. an iconic symbol of the British monarchy, stands proudly in the borough of Westminster, London. Its history is as rich and varied as the country it represents, and its walls have witnessed the lives and reigns of numerous British sovereigns. The palace's name is derived from the house constructed around 1705 for John Sheffield, the Duke of Buckingham. However, its association with British royalty began in 1762, when King George III purchased it for his wife Queen Charlotte. It was affectionately referred to as the Queen's House. The transformation of Buckingham Palace from a house to the grand structure we recognize today began in the 1820s. This monumental task was undertaken by John Nash, who expanded and redesigned the house and reshaped the Buckingham Palace Gardens. One of his notable contributions was the design of the Marble Arc entryway. However, this arc was later relocated in 1851 to the northeast corner of Hyde Park. The mall front, which is the east side of the palace, underwent an expansion in 1847 under the guidance of Edward Bloor and was later redesigned in 1913 by Sir Aston Webb. This redesign served as a backdrop for the Queen Victoria Memorial statue. Despite these changes, Nash's garden front, the west side of the palace, has remained largely unaltered. Queen Victoria was the first sovereign to reside in this palace in 1837. Buckingham Palace is not just a residence, it's a treasure trove of art and history. The Queen's Gallery inside the palace showcases many artworks from the royal collection, including precious Fabergé eggs and masterful drawings by Leonardo da Vinci. A significant attraction for tourists and locals alike is the changing of the guard. The ceremony occurs regularly, 
with its frequency varying throughout the year. Interestingly, the royal standard flag is hoisted above the palace only when the sovereign resides. In the mid-1990s, the palace's staterooms, traditionally closed to the public, were opened for tourists during August and September. This decision was made to fund the repair works of Windsor Castle, which had suffered damage from a fire in 1992. Since the mid-18th century, the Royal Muse, compromising stables, coach houses and living quarters has been a part of the palace grounds. The current structures date back to 1824-25. The Muse houses luxurious motor cars, numerous carriages and horses, all of which play a significant role in royal processions and ceremonies. Some of the notable carriages include the Gold State Coach from 1762, the Irish State Coach from 1852, the Glass State Coach from 1910 and the Diamond Jubilee State Coach from 2014. The mall leads northeast from the palace, a straight avenue that divides St. James's Park from Green Park. This avenue runs alongside the grounds of St. James's Palace. It culminates at the Admiralty Arc, a gateway to Charing Cross. Buckingham Palace is a testament to the grand hue and history of the British monarchy. Its walls have seen centuries of change and it continues to symbolize continuity, tradition and national pride. While many know it as the official residence of the British monarch, there's no much more to this grand structure than meets the eye. Let's uncover the lesser-known stories that make Buckingham Palace a treasure trove of curiosities, from ghostly tales to hidden ballrooms. Did you know about the mysterious tunnels beneath the palace? Secret tunnels beneath Buckingham Palace have been a topic of intriguing for years. While their presence is somewhat known, their purpose remains still a mystery. Some speculate they were built as escape routes during times of crisis, while others believe they were used for covert meetings between political leaders. One of the most talked about tunnels supposedly connects the palace to the Houses of Parliament. Another is believed to link directly to Clarence House. With their dimly lit corridors, these tunnels have been the subject of many urban legends, with some even suggesting they house secret treasures. Or did you know about the ghostly monk of Buckingham Palace? Every historic building has its share of ghost stories. And Buckingham Palace is no exception. The monk's tale in the brown cowl is one of the most chilling. Legend has it that this monk was once a monastery resident that stood on the palace grounds. After a failed escape attempt, he was tragically flogged to death. Since then, his spirit draped in a brown cowl is said to haunt the palace's rear terrace. Visitors and staff have reported sudden drops in temperature and an eerie feeling of being watched in this area. So keep a watchful eye on your surroundings if you visit Buckingham Palace next time. Did you know about Michael Fagan's unexpected royal visit? No? No problem. The early morning of July 9th, 1982 saw one of Royal history's most significant security breaches. An unemployed painter, Michael Fagan, scaled the palace's walls and entered Queen Elizabeth II's bedroom. The Queen, displaying remarkable composure, engaged Fagan in a conversation distracting him until security arrived. The incident raised many questions about the palace's security measures, leading to a thorough review. Fagan's motivations remain unclear, but the incident has since become a legendary tale of audacity. Did you know about the Queen's secret dance haven? While the Grand Ballroom of Buckingham Palace is known for hosting lavish state banquets and official events, there's a lesser known intimate ballroom hidden within the palace. The smaller space adorned with exquisite chandeliers and intricate artwork was considered Queen Elizabeth II's favorite. Here she has hosted private dances and gatherings away from the public eye. The very idea of a secret ballroom adds a touch of mystery and romance to the palace's history. Have you heard the story about the flamingos of Buckingham Palace? The Buckingham Palace Garden, with its lush greenery and serene lake, is a sight to behold. 
But what makes it truly unique is its resident flamingos. The elegant birds were a gift to the queen and have since made the garden their home. Over the years, they've become an unexpected and delightful visitor attraction. Their graceful present amidst the garden's natural beauty created a surreal and enchanting atmosphere. Unfortunately, in 1996, a fox breached Buckingham Palace's security and wiped out the entire flock of seven flamingos. During World War II, London faced relentless bombings from the German Luftwaffe in a campaign known as the Blitz. Despite being a symbol of British resilience, Buckingham Palace was not spared. On September 13, 1940, a bomb hit the palace, destroying the royal chapel. King George VI and Queen Elizabeth were in residence at the time but were unharmed. The Queen Mother famously remarked, I'm glad we've been bombed. It makes me feel I can look the East End in the face. This incident and her words further endeared the royal family to the British public during those challenging times. And there you have it, some quirky tales about Buckingham Palace getting you ready for the Buckingham Palace tour. If you're planning a visit, here's everything you need to know about the Buckingham Palace tour. Buckingham Palace is more than just a building. It's a symbol, known for its grandeur and historical significance. As you walk through its corridors, you're walking through history, witnessing the legacy of the British monarchy. What awaits inside? The main attraction for visitors is the stage rooms. The magnificent rooms adorned with exquisite art and decor are open to the public for a limited period each summer, from July 14th to September 24th, 2023. For those seeking a more intimate experience, exclusive guided tours are available during winter and spring on selected dates. These tours offer a deeper dive into the palace history and secrets. The price and structure for the summer opening of Buckingham Palace is as follows. Adults pay in advance £30 and on the day £33. Young persons between the age of 18 to 24 pay in advance £19.50 and on the day £21.50. Children between 5 to 17 pay £16.50 in advance and £18 on the day. Disabled pay in advance $16.50 and £18 on the day. And under 5 go free. For those interested in exclusive guiding tours during winter and spring, the cost is £90 per person. A unique family guided tour is also available with children aged 5 to 17 priced at $49.50 and under 5s entering for free. The state rooms remain closed during the summer opening on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. From July 14th to August 31st, the palace is open from 9.30 to 7.30 in the evening, with the last admission at 5.15. From the 1st to September 24th, the timing shifts slightly to 9.30 a.m. to 6.30 p.m., with the last entry at 4.15. The exclusive guided tours, available from November to May, vary in schedule. They are conducted on Fridays, Saturdays and Sundays at specific times, with each tour lasting approximately 90 minutes. Some practical tips for you, my dear listeners, if you plan to visit Buckingham Palace. Pre-booking your tickets is advisable, although on the day purchases are possible based on availability. Allocate between two to two and a half hours for the summer opening to fully immerse yourself in the experience. Wear comfortable shoes. The visitor route includes a walk through the garden, culminating in a gravel path. Toilets and baby care facilities are located in the garden. Note that there are no toilet facilities at the start of the visitor route. An airport-style security check awaits all visitors. And inside the palace, photography is prohibited. However, the memories you make will last a lifetime. While eating and drinking inside the palace is restricted, the Garden Cafe offers a delightful relaxing spot after your tour. How do you get to Buckingham Palace? Well, it's very easily accessible. If you're taking the underground, stations like Victoria, Green Park, St. James's Park and Hyde Park Corner are your best bet. 
Buses 11, 211, C1 and C10 also stop at Buckingham Palace Road. Victoria Coach Station is a mere 10 minute walk from the palace for those traveling by coach. A visit to Buckingham Palace is a journey through time, offering a glimpse into the royal lives and Britain's history. Whether you are a history buff, an art lover or simply curious, the Buckingham Palace tour promises an experience like no other. So, the next time you're in London, ensure the palace is on your itinerary. You might be asking yourself if visiting Buckingham Palace is worth it with children. Well, I can say Buckingham Palace is a child's dream adventure. The state rooms cater to the curiosity and imagination of children. Here's a detailed exploration of the top 10 highlights for children at the state rooms. First up, we have the throne room and ballroom, a royal affair. The throne room houses three majestic royal thrones. Children can embark on a fun quest to identify who sat on each throne. Interestingly, one of these thrones is notably smaller, crafted for Queen Victoria, who was petite. This room has been the backdrop for significant events, including the coronation of King Charles III and Queen Camilla in 2023 of this year and the wedding of Prince William and Catherine Middleton in 2011. The ballroom with its grandeur can accommodate 84 double-decker buses. Yes, you heard it right, 84 double-decker buses. It serves as a venue for state banquets during official visits by foreign dignitaries. On number two, we have the white drawing room, the secrets and portraits. A hidden door in the room leads from the royal family's private apartments. Children can engage in a delightful game of spotting this concealed entrance. Dominating the room is a painting of Queen Alexandra, the concert of Edward VII and Queen Victoria's eldest son. Then we have the marvelous marble hall. The marble hall is adorned with exquisite statues, including a captivating sculpture by the renowned artist Canova at the staircase base. This masterpiece depicts Mars, the Roman god of war, alongside Venus, the goddess of love. The statue, standing over two meters tall, was carved from a single marble block. Number four is the green drawing room. After ascending the grand staircase, visitors enter the vibrant room. A painting here features two daughters of Philip II, King of Spain. A fun activity for children is to count the number of animals accompanying the princesses in the artwork. Number five is the picture gallery. Designed to display the George VI art collection, the gallery houses numerous masterpieces. A standout piece is a painting of Agatha Bess by Rembrandt, where the artist's imaginative frame gives the illusion that Agatha is about to step out of the canvas. Number six is the music room. The tall dark blue columns in the music room are not what they seem. While they appear to be made of the blue stone called lapis lazuli, they are crafted from a particular type of plaster using a technique known as gaglolia. The ceiling here is adorned with symbols representing England, Ireland and Scotland. Number seven is Look Up the Marvel. The state rooms boost intricately decorated ceilings that testify to the artistic brilliance. In the music room, for instance, the ceiling features the national emblems of rose, shamrock and sizzle. On number eight, we have a symphony of clocks. Buckingham Palace is home to 500 clocks, each telling a tale of changing fashions and royal tastes over the centuries. From musical to astronomical clocks, this collection is a treat for horology enthusiasts. Adjusting all these timepieces during the spring and autumn time changes is a task that takes over 50 hours. On number 9 we have the Buckingham Palace Garden. The palace gardens spanning 16 hectares are a haven for wildlife including birds, fish and insects. During the summer opening children can explore the garden trail, discover various wildlife habitats and learn about significant events in this green expanse. And on number 10, we have the free entry for the little ones. It's worth noting that children under the age of five enjoy free entry to Buckingham Palace, making it an even more enticing destination for families.
The state rooms of Buckingham Palace offer a world of discovery, wonder and learning for children. From spotting hidden doors and identifying royal thrones to marveling at art and exploring vast gardens, there is a treasure trove of experience awaiting young visitors. So when planning a family visit to Buckingham Palace, rest assured that the little ones will have a royal adventure to remember. And who knows, maybe you will even meet the king. So you watched the changing of the guard and visited Buckingham Palace. What else can be done? Well, let's discover the charms around Buckingham Palace. Buckingham Palace with its regal splendor is undoubtedly a jewel in London's crown. But the treasures don't end at the palace gates. The surrounding area is brimming with attractions that promise a rich blend of history, culture and leisure. Here's a guide to some of the top activities and sites to explore near Buckingham Palace. On number one, we have the Houses of Parliament and Big Ben. A stone's throw away from Buckingham Palace, the Houses of Parliament is a testament to Britain's rich political history. With its iconic Big Ben clock tower, this neo-Gothic marvel is a hub for political activity and an architectural masterpiece. And the best part is this year, you can walk up 300 stairs all the way up the Elizabeth Tower to meet Big Ben. Yes, you heard it right. Big Ben is open for tours. Tours are sold on the Houses of Parliament website and sell very, very fast. New tickets become available at the beginning of each month. So take a look on the website and get your tickets. On number two, we have St. James's Park. This tranquil oasis offers a serene escape right in the city's heart. Its picturesque lake, abundant wildlife and beautifully manicured gardens make it a perfect spot for a leisurely stroll or a picnic. On number three we have Westminster Abbey. This Gothic Abbey is a UNESCO World Heritage Site that has witnessed numerous royal weddings, coronations and funerals. Its stunning architecture and historical significance make it a must visit. On number four, we have Churchill War Rooms. Step back in time and delve into the underground bunker where Winston Churchill and his wartime government orchestrated their strategies during World War II. This museum offers a fascinating glimpse into Britain's wartime history. On number five, we have the Battle of Britain Monument. Located at the Victoria Embankment, the monument pays tribute to the brave pilots who defended Britain during the pivotal Battle of Britain in World War II. On six, we have the League Street Arcs. This tunnel is an underground haven for street art enthusiasts. It showcases a dynamic display of graffiti and murals celebrating urban artistry at its finest. On number seven, we have bike tours. And if your feet are killing you, take a breakaway bike tour and experience London on a bike. These guided tours offer a unique way to explore the city, covering significant landmarks and hidden gems alike. On eight, we have Westminster Bridge. This historic bridge offers unparalleled views of the Thames, the Houses of Parliament and the London Eye. It's an excellent spot for photography or simply to take in the views. On nine, we have the Florence Nightingale Museum. Dedicated to the legendary nurse who revolutionized the nursing field, this museum offers insights into her life, work and enduring legacy. On 10 we have the Mary Seacole statue. Located near St. Thomas Hospital, the statue honors Mary Seacole, a pioneering nurse and heroine of the Crimean War. On 11 we have the Boat Show Comedy Club. Located on the Tattershall Castle Boat, this comedy club promises an evening of laughter with some of the best stand-up acts in the city. And on 12 we have the National Gallery. Situated at Trafalgar Square, this art museum boasts an impressive collection of Western European paintings from the 13th to the 19th centuries. 
The vicinity of Buckingham Palace is a treasure trove of attractions, each offering a unique experience. Whether you're a history buff, an art lover, or someone looking to relax and unwind, there's something for everyone. So, when visiting Buckingham Palace, remember to explore the gems just beyond its gates. But let's circle back a bit, back to St. James's Park, a royal retreat in the heart of London. Nestled in the heart of the city of Westminster, St. James Park is a 23-hectare, 57-acre urban oasis that has been a cornerstone of London's landscape since the 16th century. As one of the royal parks, it offers both locals and tourists a respite from the hustle and bustle of the city life, with its picturesque lake, historic monuments and diverse flora and fauna. The origins of St. James Park can be traced back to the 1530s when King Henry VIII enclosed the area for a deer park near the Palace of Whitehall. Over the centuries, the park underwent various transformations. James I in 1603 ordered the park to be drained and landscaped, introducing exotic animals such as camels, crocodiles, elephants and birds. Inspired by French royal gardens, Charles II redesigned the park in a more formal style, introducing an ornamental canal and opening the park to the public. What can you see and do at St. James Park? Well, first we have St. James Park Lake. The Serene Lake is home to two islands, West Island and Duck Island. The latter is particularly notable for its collection of waterfowl. The Blue Bridge across the lake offers breathtaking views of Buckingham Palace to the west and the grounds of the Horse Guards Parade to the east. Up next we have the Pelicans. One of the park's most unique attractions is its resident colony of pelicans. These birds have been a park feature since 1664 when a Russian ambassador gifted them to Charles II. While most of these pelicans have clipped wings, there's one that occasionally takes flight beyond the park's boundaries. The pelicans of St. James Parks have a rich history dating back to the 17th century. Over the years there have been rumors and tales about these birds. One such story that has made the rounds is that the pelicans eat pigeons. Yes, you heard right. While this might sound like an urban legend, there have been occasional reports of such incidents, adding a touch of mystery to these otherwise gentle birds. If you have the stomach for it, just Google it on YouTube. Number three on the list what to do at St. James Park, we have the playground. For families, the park boasts a children's playground complete with a giant sandpit, ensuring fun for the little ones. And of course, we have the flora. The park is home to various tree species, including plane trees, scarlet oak and black mulberry, and fig trees. Then you maybe wonder, is it free? Yes! St. James Park is open to the public and free of charge. You see, St. James Park is more than just a green space in London. It's a testament to the city's rich history and commitment to preserving nature amidst urban development. Whether you want to learn about its past, enjoy a leisurely stroll, or simply watch the pelicans, this park has something for everyone. So remember to add St. James Park to your itinerary the next time you are in London. And who knows, you might just catch a glimpse of that elusive flying pelican. But now, away from palaces, pelicans and other fun activities. If you're in London on September 1st, then my dear muggle, you better head over to King's Cross. In the bustling heart of London, amidst the modern hustle and bustle, lies a portal to a magical realm. Every year on the 1st of September, King's Cross Station transforms into a haven for witches, wizards and muggles alike. This transformation is all in celebration of Back to Hogwarts Day. But what makes this day so special and why has it captured the hearts of millions worldwide? 
The significance of the 1st of September in the Harry Potter series is well documented. It's the day when students of Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry board the Hogwarts Express, embarking on a journey filled with adventure, friendship and magic. Over the years, this fictional narrative has transcended the pages of J.K. Rowling's books, evolving into a real-world celebration. What began as a modest gathering of diehard fans has now become a global phenomenon, with many searching for the Harry Potter Day in London experience. King's Cross Station, with its blend of Victorian architecture and modern design, serves as the perfect backdrop for its magical event. The highlight is, of course, Platform 9 three quarters. Here, fans can see pushing trolleys through the wall, reenacting the iconic scene from the books. The atmosphere is electric, with the air filled with excitement and anticipation. Many often wonder, is Hogwarts in London? And this event brings the magical world to life in the heart of the city. At precisely 11 a.m., the departure board displays the Hogwarts Express departure. And not to the exact time the train leaves in the series. This moment is further elevated with the melodic strains of Hedwig's theme evoking a sense of nostalgia and wonder. May I have your attention please? The Hogwarts Express is now departing from platform 9 and 3 quarters. All students are kindly reminded to stick to your ticket and board the carriage at once. All aboard! The official Harry Potter fan club Wizarding World ensures that the day is packed with activities. From sampling the frosty delights of butterbeer to challenging fellow fans in a game of Hogwarts Legacy on PlayStation 5. There's something for everyone. The Lego Harry Potter giveaways are a hit among younger fans. While photo sessions allow attendees to capture memories that last a lifetime. Many often inquire how long is the Harry Potter experience in London and with events like these the magic seems to last all day. For cinephiles, the Everyman King's Cross Cinema offers a treat. Imagine watching all eight Harry Potter films in succession. Reliving the magic from the very beginning, additionally, select audience cinemas pay homage to the series by screening the first two films, allowing fans to reminisce about the early days of Harry and his friends. While King's Cross is undoubtedly the main attraction, the spirit of Back to Hogwarts Day permeates throughout London. Various establishments join in the festivities, offering zine menus, merchandise and events. Walking tours take fans through filming locations, while theatres showcase plays inspired by the wizarding world. Back to Hogwarts Day is more than just an event. It's a testament to the timeless appeal of the Harry Potter series. It's a day when fans, regardless of age, nationality or background, come together to celebrate a world that has given them so much joy, hope and a sense of belonging. So come September 1st, done your robes, grab your wand and join fellow fans in celebrating the magic that is Harry Potter at King's Cross. And now it's time for your questions. From Hobart, Mark asks, is Boxing Day in London a yay or a nay? Boxing Day, celebrated on December 26th, is a holiday steeped in tradition and history. Originating in the UK, it's a day that has been marked by various customs, from giving box gifts to the less fortunate to enjoying festive leftovers. But when it comes to spending Boxing Day in London, opinions often diverge. Is it a good idea? Or not. Let's delve into the pros and cons to help you decide. The upside of Boxing Day in London. Of course, it's the shopping extravaganza. Boxing Day sales in London are legendary. Major department stores and high street brands offer significant discounts, making it a haven for shopaholics. From Oxford Street to Regent Street, the city buzzes with excitement and the spirit of grabbing a good deal. Then we have the festive atmosphere. The holiday decorations are still up and the city is adorned in its festive best. 
the twinkling lights, beautifully decorated shop windows and the general air of merriment make for a delightful experience. Of course, sporting events cannot be missed. For sport enthusiasts, Boxing Day in London is synonymous with football. The Premier League traditionally hosts a full fixture list and attending a match can be a thrilling experience. Then we have quite a tourist spot. While the shopping districts might be bustling, many of London's iconic tourist spots are quieter, offering a more relaxed experience. But then there's also the downside of Boxing Day in London. Of course, we have first the crowded shopping districts. The lure of Boxing Day sales means that shopping areas can be incredibly crowded. Expect long queues both outside and inside the stores. There is limited public transport. While public transport runs on Boxing Day, services can be limited. This might mean longer waiting times and crowded buses and trains. Also, some attractions may be closed. Some tourist attractions, restaurants and smaller shops might remain closed on Boxing Day, limiting your sightseeing or dining options. And of course, the weather. December in London can be cold, wet and sometimes even snowy. If you're not a fan of chilly weather, wandering around the city might not be the most pleasant experience. So you see, Boxing Day in London comes with its sets of highs and lows. For those who thrive in the festive hustle and bustle and are keen on snagging a deal, it's a fantastic time to be in the city. However, suppose you prefer a quieter, more relaxed holiday experience. In that case, you might find the crowds and limited services overwhelming. Whether Boxing Day in London is a good or bad idea depends on your individual preferences. But one thing is for sure. London with its charm and character never fails to offer a memorable experience, no matter when you choose to visit. Lucy from Hanover asks, London Dungeon or Tower Bridge experience? Well, Lucy, London with its rich history and iconic landmarks offer many attractions for residents and tourists. The London Dungeon and the Tower Bridge experience stand out as two must-visit destinations. But if you're pressed for time or budget and must choose between the two, which one should you opt for? Hmm, let's dive into a comparative analysis to help you decide. First up, we have the London Dungeon. The London Dungeon is a uniquely thrilling attraction that delves into London's dark and gruesome history. Visitors are taking on a journey through 1000 years of the city's most sinister tales through a combination of live actors, special effects and rides. The pros. First, interactive experience. Live actors make the stories come alive, ensuring an immersive experience. Number two of the pros, a variety of shows. From the tales of Jack the Ripper to the Great Fire of London, many stories are covered. And on number three, it's educational. While primarily an entertainment attraction, visitors also get insights into London's history. And on number four, we have the great thrill. So if you enjoy a good scare, this is the place for you. On the con side, we have it's not suitable for everyone. Some scenes can be intense and unsuitable for younger children or those who have sensitive disposition. And of course, it can get crowded, especially during peak tourist seasons. There might be a long waiting time. So let's take a look over at the Tower Bridge experience. The Tower Bridge experience allows visitors to explore one of the London's most iconic landmarks, the Tower Bridge. It includes access to the high-level walkways, offering panoramic views of the city and the Victorian engine rooms, showcasing the bridge's engineering marvels. So what are the pros? On number one, we have the stunning views. The glass floor walkways provide breathtaking views of the River Thames and the London skyline. On number two, we have the historical insights. You can learn about the history and construction of the bridge through interactive displays. And on number three, it's family friendly, suitable for visitors of all ages, including children. 
And on number four, we have unique features. The glass floor on the walkway offers a unique perspective, allowing visitors to watch the bustling bridge below. What are the cons? Number one, it's less theatrical. Unlike the London Dungeons, this is more of an informative experience than an interactive show. On two, we have the height concerns. Those who fear heights might find the walkways a bit daunting. So your choice between the London Dungeon and the Tower Bridge experience boils down to your interests. If you're looking for a thrilling interactive experience that delves into the London's dark history, the London Dungeon is your pick. If you prefer a more serene, informative experience that offers stunning views and insights into one of London's engineering marvels, then the Tower Bridge experience is the way to go. Both attractions offer a unique experience, ensuring that no matter which you choose, you're in for a memorable time. Geraldine from Austin asks, I would really like some advice on using the tube for a wheelchair user. I know some stations are step free, but what is the reality? For example, are there long corridors? Is it too busy to get on easily? Any tips would be appreciated. Navigating the London Tube as a wheelchair user can be a challenging experience. Still, it can be made more manageable with some preparations and knowledge. Here's a comprehensive guide to help you. First up, step-free access. While many tube stations now offer step-free access from the street to the platform, checking in advance is essential. Transport for London TFL provides a step-free tube guide, which is regularly updated. You will find the link to the guide in the show notes. There might be even long corridors and transfers. Even if a station is step-free, it might have long corridors or require transfers between lines that can be pretty distant. Stations like King's Cross and Pancras are vast and can be tiring to navigate. It's a good idea to familiarize yourself with the layout of the stations you'll be using. Have an eye on the peak times and crowds. The tube can get incredibly busy, especially during rush hours, typically between 7.30 to 9.30 a.m. and 5 to 7 p.m. on weekdays. Try to avoid traveling during these times. A less crowded train means you'll have a better chance of finding space for your wheelchair. Then we have boarding the train. Most trains have a designated wheelchair space. However, standing passengers can sometimes occupy these, especially during busy times. Feel free to ask for assistance or let passengers know that you need the space. The gap between the train and the platform can vary, so always approach cautiously. Get staff assistance. TFL staff are generally very helpful and can assist you in boarding or alighting from trains to navigating stations. If you know your travel plans in advance, you can book assistance to ensure someone is available to help you. Also check alternative routes. Sometimes it might be easier to take a slightly longer route that uses more accessible stations or requires fewer changes. Planning a journey with accessibility in mind can make the trip smoother. And maybe consider taking buses as an alternative. All London buses are wheelchair accessible and each bus can carry one wheelchair user. Suppose the tube seems too daunting or the stage you're starting from or going to isn't accessible. In that case, buses might be a good alternative. Also, several apps and websites, including the official TFL site, can help you plan an accessible journey. They provide real-time information on lift outages and other accessibility issues. Also be prepared for disruptions. Occasionally lifts might be out of service. Checking for any service disruptions before you travel is a good idea. And of course, always communicate your needs. Whether it's asking someone to give you up the wheelchair space on a train or seeking assistance from staff, being clear about what you need can make your journey smoother. While the tube can present challenges for wheelchair users, it's possible to navigate the system with some planning and awareness. Always allow extra time for your journey, especially if you need to familiarize yourself with the route or stations. 
And remember, you are entitled to the same level of access and service as any other passenger. So don't be afraid to advocate for yourself. Safe travels! Garcia asks, is the first week in November a good time to go to London? Garcia, there is never a bad time to go to London. The first week of November can be a unique and exciting time to visit London. Still, like any travel decision, it has pros and cons. Here's a breakdown. The pros of visiting London in the first week of November. There is the Bonfire Night. November 5th is Guy Fawkes Night, also known as Bonfire Night. It commemorates the gunpowder plot of 1605, when Guy Fawkes and his co-conspirators attempted to blow up the Houses of Parliament. Today it's celebrated with fireworks displays and bonfires throughout the city. It's a cultural experience that is unique to the UK. Next we have fewer tourists. By November the peak tourist season has ended, which means fewer crowds at major attractions, shorter queues and potentially lower accommodation prices. The London parks like Hyde Park, Regent's Park or St. James's Park are adorned with autumn foliage. The crisp air and colorful leaves create a picturesque setting. November also marks the beginning of London's winter cultural season, which you can catch various plays, concerts and exhibits that kick off during this month. And of course we have the Christmas lights. By early November London starts gearing up for Christmas. Some areas like Oxford Street and Regent Street may begin to turn on the Christmas lights, transforming the city into a winter wonderland. What are the cons of visiting London in the first week of November? Of course, the weather. November in London can be chilly and damp. While snow is rare, rain is common. So packing an umbrella and waterproof shoes is essential. There are shorter days. Daylight decreases significantly by November. With the sun setting as early as 4.30 pm, this can limit your sightseeing hours. While most major attractions remain open, some outdoor attractions or tours might operate on limited hours or close for the season. So, the first week of November offers a blend of cultural experiences, festive vibes and the beauty of autumn in London. While the weather might be unpredictable, with the proper preparations it can be an excellent time to experience the city without the throngs of summer tourists. If you enjoy cultural events, festive atmospheres and don't mind packing a few extra layers, the first week of November could be an excellent time for your London adventure. Lily from Los Angeles asks, is it worth doing a London night tour by bus? A London night tour by bus can be a magical experience, Lily, offering a different perspective of the city compared to daytime tours. However, whether it's worth, it depends on individual preferences and what you hope to get out of the experience. Here's a breakdown to help you decide. The pros of a London night tour by bus. First, we have the illuminated landmarks. Many of London's iconic landmarks such as the Houses of Parliament, Tower Bridge and the London Eye are beautifully illuminated at night. The city takes on a different character under the glow of these lights, making for some fantastic photo opportunities. On number two, we have less traffic. London is notorious for its traffic congestion. However, in the evening, especially after the rush hour, the roads are generally quieter, making the bus tour smoother and more enjoyable. On number three, we have the cooler atmosphere. During the summer months, London can be quite warm. An evening bus tour can be a more comfortable and cooler way to see the city. And on four, we have the unique experience. The ambience of London at night with its bustling nightlife, street performers and the general evening bus offers a unique experience compared to daytime tours. And of course, you have the themed tours. Some night bus tours offer themed experience, such as ghost tours, which delve into city spooky history and legends. But what are the cons of a London night tour by bus? Number one, we have limit visibility. While major landmarks are illuminated, some parts of the city might be too dark to see clearly from the bus. 
Number two, we have a shorter duration. Night tours are shorter than their daytime counterparts, covering fewer attractions. Number three, we have the cold weather. It can get quite chilly if you're visiting during the colder months and the bus is open topped. Make sure to dress warmly. Number four, we have fewer departures. Night tours typically have fewer departures times than daytime tours which might limit flexibility in your schedule. A London night tour by bus can be a memorable experience, offering a fresh perspective on the city's landmarks and ambience. If you enjoy seeing cities illuminated at night and are looking for a unique way to explore London, it's definitely worth considering. However, suppose you're keen on getting detailed insights into each attraction and prefer daylight for photography. In that case, you should stick with a daytime tour and complement it with a night tour for a comprehensive experience. My favorite London night bus tour is the Christmas lights bus tour. It's just magical. And just saying. <laughs> Mary Ann asks, which is the best place to stay in London for a first time visitor? Good question, Mary Ann. Choosing the right place to stay for a first time visitor to London can significantly enhance the experience. London is vast with many neighborhoods, each offering its unique charm. Here's a breakdown of some of the best areas for first time visitors, considering factors like proximity to major attractions, transport links, dining options and ambience. Number one is the Westminster and Victoria. The pros are the central location with iconic landmarks like Buckingham Palace, the Houses of Parliament and Westminster Abbey. It has very good transport links with several tube stations. The cons, it can be pricey and might feel a bit too touristy for some. Next we have on our list the Covent Garden and the West End. Pros, vibrant area known for its theaters, restaurants and street performers, walking distance to attractions like the British Museum and Leicester Square. The cons, it can be noisy at night due to its bustling nightlife. On number three, we have South Kensington and Chelsea. On the pro side, we have the upscale neighborhoods with attractions like the Natural History Museum, Victoria and Albert Museum and the Royal Albert Hall. Close to Hyde Park, the cons. The accommodations can be on the pricier side, so keep an eye on the price. And on the four we have the city, London's financial district or the city of London. On the pro side we have the central location with attractions like the Tower of London and St. Paul's Cathedral. It's quieter during weekends and for the cons can feel a bit deserted on weekends and it's primarily a business district. On number five, we have Bloomsbury. For the pros, it's central and relatively quiet, home to the British Museum and close to Covent Garden and Soho. On the cons, we have fewer nightlife options compared to other central areas. On number six, we have Soho and Leicester Square. The pros, of course, it's the heart of London's entertainment district with numerous dining and nightlife options and it's close to major shopping streets. On the other hand, on the cons, it can be very noisy and crowded, especially on weekends. On number seven, we have the South Bank and Waterloo. The pros are it's along the River Thames with attractions like the London Eye, the Tate Modern and Shakespeare's Globe. Great riverside walks, by the way. For the cons, we have it can get crowded, it's especially during events and festivals or peak tourist times. The best place to stay in London for a first-time visitor largely depends on individual preferences, budget and interests. If you prioritize being in the heart of the action, areas like Covent Garden or so might be ideal. If you prefer a quieter but central location, Bloomsbury or South Kensington could be more suitable. Regardless of where you choose to stay, London's efficient public transport system ensures that you are never too far from from the city's myriad attractions. It's always a good idea to book accommodation well in advance, especially during peak tourist seasons, to secure the best deals and locations. 
And on that note, ladies and gentlemen, fellow London enthusiasts, as we draw the curtains on another episode of London Ask and Answered. Let's take a moment to reflect on our journey today. We've strolled through the majestic gates of Buckingham Palace, delved deep into its rich tapestry of history and navigated the bustling streets that surround this iconic landmark. And who could forget our magical detour, marking our calendars for the enchanting back to Hogwarts day. Truly, London charm knows no bounds. But if today's tales have left you yearning for more, I've got just the thing for you. Dive deeper into the heart of the big smoke with my book, London Ask and Answered Your Comprehensive Travel Guide to the Big Smoke. It's a treasure trove of stories, tips and insights waiting to be discovered. Whether you're nestled in a cozy corner with a paperback or exploring digitally with the ebook, it promises to be your perfect companion in unraveling London's many mysteries. Find it everywhere books are sold and embark on a journey like no other. Now, a little birdie or perhaps a big red bus told me that many of you have questions, curiosities and tales of your own. And I'm all ears. Whether it's a quirky anecdote, a burning query or just a shout out, I want to hear from you. Connect with me on social media at London Ask. Drop me a line at hello at londonask.com. Ping me on WhatsApp at 0044 7700 Or for a more old school touch, visit londonask.com slash ask. Every question is a new adventure and I can't wait to embark on it with you. So, as the London fog settles and the city lights twinkle in the distance, I leave you with dreams of double-decker buses, historic alleys and the ever-present allure of the Thames. Until we meet again in the next episode, keep the London spirit alive, keep the questions coming and always remember... Cheerio! Oh, 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 o